Yeah, so, um, hi, I'm Jan. You may notice my name from all the millions of commercial emails I sent around, at least on the connection list, uh, mailing list or something like that. I'm a PhD student in Gregor's lab. And I'm also one of the developers of CEDA, which is basically the open source simulators um, that we use in 90% of all our modeling projects right now. But as you've seen before, there's a bit of a debate. We also have the other simulation framework for MATLAB. And, but we also have CEDA and this is what this will be about. And uh, the big advantage of CEDA is that instead of MATLAB, you really have a graphical programming interface. So the idea is that you can really drag and drop whole architectures together. So it's really a software that's meant to be for fast prototyping, for example, if that's uh, something you're interested in. CEDAR is actually an, an acronym, and uh, I only have to, I, I cannot remember it, but if you look at the webpage, you see it's Cognition, Embodiment, Dynamics, and Autonomy in Robotics. And that was because the, the first initial uh, idea was to have a software where you can also program uh, like architectures that you can then connect to robots and there's still some of that left in CEDA and it's also quite nice for example in the workshop we'll be able to develop a reaching architecture with sort of a, a simulated robot in there but first things first before I talk a lot I, I will just show you what it is and where you can get it uh, if you go to our web page here you can see there's only one button uh, download now so we just click it and there are two ways in which you can get CEDA because it's an open source software you could get the source code from Git and then uh, compile it yourself. And then you will get sort of the latest version of CEDA, which is actually a bit ahead of the pre-built apps we have here. But that also takes quite a lot because you have installed quite a number of libraries there. And also the most recent version might not be the most stable one, it has a lot of features, but they're all not perfect, right? So what we will use here are these stable pre-built apps that we here offer for all the different operating systems. Uh, actually, Daniel Sabinas and Paul Grieven did put in a last minute effort to also get the latest Apple version, as far as I've heard. So there's really a lot of effort put in. Uh, and ideally, you just download any of these, depending on your operating system. And then you get uh, a zip file, which contains something like that. Uh, depending on your operating system, it might be a different file. So a folder and then this batch file, for example, on Windows. And if you double click on that, it just opens CEDA. So you don't need to install anything. Uh, it just comes pre-compiled as an executable. And then you get this, this simulator interface here, which has sort of three big components. One would be the top here, which is sort of the toolbar, which gives you a lot of different elements that you can use. And then the main part here would be this large canvas where you can then build an architecture. And the way these interact is really, you just take one of these tools here, for example, a neural field and drag it in, right? This will create sort of a neural field instance here. And if you click on it, on the right-hand side, you get sort of all the parameters and properties of that neural field. And I'll go through these step-by-step step because the first goal of this tutorial is to connect all this to the simulator you've seen yesterday, right? So you now sort of have all the same ground to, to take off here. So um, yesterday, everything was a 1D dimensional field. So the first parameter that we will change here of this field uh, will be the dimensional T2 is the default here, but we will change that to one. And you can also see that the icon here changes. And what this uh, sort of building block here tells you is that it has on the left side always inputs and on the right side, you have some outputs. And this way you can connect multiple building blocks and I'll, I'll show, that, show that in a second. The other thing that you can do, this, this block represents one neural field. And the idea is here that you can look at the contents of that block by plotting it, right? So if you click right click on it, you get multiple options and the, the default one is always field plot. So if you click on that, you see these, these lines here that might be a bit familiar, but still don't mean anything. So if you right click here again, choose legend, uh, if you see this for the first time, you see that blue is input, green is activation, and red is sort of the, the uh, sigmoid activation, so the buff threshold. And in order to then start the simulation, because as you can see, this is all still pretty static, there's a big play button on the top left corner here. So if you press this, you see a little bit of change now 
all the activation here is wobbling around because there's just static neural noise on there, right? So this would be sort of the case from yesterday, your, your 1D field, but without any inputs. And while yesterday you just had a couple of sliders to change these around, the idea in CEDA is, is that everything is modular, so you can easily add input, remove input, and uh, then sort of build entire architectures by that. So yesterday we had these Gaussian inputs, and that's also one of the uh, steps here in CEDA. By the way, you can see here there are a lot of tabs with a lot of different steps. But to be honest, for 99% of your work, you just need what is in the favorites tab, because these are sort of the basic elementary operations. And the one thing that we use a lot is the Gaussian input. So if you drag that in, that is also one of these elements here. But because it's an input, it has no inputs itself, right? It only has one output. The other thing is, in order to connect two elements here in CEDA, you need them to be of the same resolution and the same dimensionality. So this field has a dimensionality of one, right? Because I changed that, and sort of a resolution of 50 here, right? In theory, of course, the field is a continuous thing, so it has a continuous dimension, but in reality, if you simulate a computer, you have to do so with real numbers, right? So the default size is 50, that kind of resolution seems fine for also 90% of the simulation. So it's a well-established default parameter. I think it hasn't changed in the last eight years or so. <laughs> and in order to now connect this, if you want to just drag here, you see already that this turns red because our Gaussian input has also this default dimensionality of two. So change this to one as well, and then we have one and 50, and then you can just left click here and drag sort of a connection to the neural field. And when this happens, you see already, okay, there's a Gaussian input happening here. So you can see now that the input sum has changed and also the activation, of course, because uh, that's related, like depends on the input. And now if you want to change something about the Gaussian input, you cannot look here in the neural field, but of course, in the Gaussian input steps, so if you left click here, you get all the other parameters as well. For example, the amplitude, right? Then you can raise or lower the amplitude, can even form a peak. Or you could, for example, change the center which is sort of the mean of the Gaussian or the sigma, right, which determines the width. And uh, this is the idea uh, to easily add one input. If you want a second one, you could, of course, drag a second one in, or maybe to show this, because this speeds up everything a lot, you can easily duplicate steps by selecting them and then pressing Control D, for example, and then you can just add a second Gaussian input. Now they would be overlapping, so you cannot see much. But if you change, for example, the center of the second one, you can see that these are two different Gaussian inputs here coming into this field. And as with all elements, you can also plot, for example, this Gaussian, right? So you can right click here, press, press plot, see this one, and also right click on this. So you get an easy overview on what is going on here in this architecture, actually. So this is almost the simulator you've seen yesterday, right? Just in, with a different interface. Basically, what you see in the plots would be what you've seen yesterday, and the sliders are all hidden behind these parameters here on the right side when you click on the individual elements. The only thing that you also saw yesterday was the kernel of the field, and that's maybe a good point to go through all the different parameters here. So you can plot the kernel as well. The field plot gives you just the field, but if you go on this plot option, you'd see like there's tons of options. You could plot the noise or just some location of maximum, some readout. But what we're interested in is actually the full lateral kernel. So that would be sort of the kernel picture that was also in the simulator yesterday, right? So um, now maybe it's a good time to look at all the parameters you can see here on the right hand side. Uh, I already talked about dimensionality and the size, right? Then there's a time scale that's basically the tau in front of the formula, like how fast does your field actually develop in time. Then there's the, the resting level, of course, uh, that you can see is minus five. You can see that here in the plot as well. Then there is the, the noise gain, right? If you bump that up, you can have a very noisy field. You can also reduce this to zero and then uh, nothing changes that much. You can also change the way the output is actually forwarded, right? Uh, so everything that's above threshold, here we use sort of a very simple absolute sigmoid, which has a very steep beta, as you can see here. 
sort of the default parameter for CEDAR. So uh, if you want to change that, you can, you can do this, but it will not be important for the tutorial here. One that might be a bit more important though, is the global inhibition. You had this also in the lecture and also in the other um, simulator. So if you ramp this down to zero, then the whole kernel is basically situated at zero, but uh, usually you have some global inhibition and you can sort of move. If you see the legend here on the left side, move the whole kernel down and sort of this way specify the global inhibition that holds across the field, right? And then the individual parts here are listed. That's a bit weird in CEDAR. There is actually a list of kernels. And this is why this is hidden here in lateral kernels. And then we open here with our first kernel, which is the Gaussian. So that's just uh, this one here. So if you ramp that up, uh, you can increase the amplitude or the size, uh, like the width with using sigma. And the most important case where you need this list of kernels is actually when you want to implement this Mexican hat kernel, right? Uh, that you had also in the lectures, I assume. So to do that, you could specify a Mexican hat, right? But what you can also do, of course, is build a Mexican hat by using two Gaussians. So the idea is to have one excitatory part that's a bit, uh, has a very small sigma and then an inhibitory part that has a wide sigma. So in order to do that, here we have the excitatory part already with an amplitude of one and a sigma of three. We can just add another one by choosing here lateral kernels Gauss and then clicking on this plus button. And this will just add a second one with the same parameters. So in order to make this negative now, we change the amplitude to minus one. And in order to not cancel this out, we extend the sigma, right? So let's say something like 10. And then with a combination of these two kernels, you get this kind of Mexican head shape, right? So that is required, for example, for the working memory fields. So this would be sort of the first overview of how CEDAR functions and how you can replicate the simulator from yesterday using CEDAR, right? For just a sim single field, that's a lot of overhead. <laughs> just starting the other simulator takes one second, building and explaining this took a bit longer here. But you can, of course, see the obvious power of this is that this is very modular and you can easily build a large architecture just by clicking, dragging and dropping and choosing some parameters. And that's what we're going to do for the rest of this tutorial. And uh, that will be sort of be the preparation for the homework assignment. And uh, before that, I should actually show you where you can find that. So if you go onto our summer school page, right? And under the documents section, there you can find CEDAR tutorial and exercise. And there are two documents here. One is sort of an FAQ document, so that might come in handy later, maybe. And the other would be this tutorial and exercise. So uh, what this does is it explains first how to get CEDAR. If you forgot the URL already, that's fine. So you can just click here again on it. And then it has sort of three demos that I'm going to show now. So there will be a multi-peak detection, demo of working memory, and the dem demo of selection. And then in the end, there's sort of this homework exercise where you build a small architecture. And what I will do is I will basically do the first three things here, live with you, and then you at home do the fourth one. Um, but before that, I just want to make room for, for any questions you might have. So up to this point, was there anything too clear, uh, unclear? And I'm also, I tend to be, too fast for these kind of demos. So <laughs> stop me at any time. Any question up till now? Uh, if that's not the case, then I will just move on. So the first task here would be, we want to have a, a multi-peak field. So a field that represents multi multiple peaks. And because the, the homework exercise actually works in 2D, we will do the whole thing here in two dimensions. Also, you've got this 2D fields introduced in today's lecture, so it might be a bit more interesting here. So uh, first things first, we maybe delete everything here and just start afresh. And the idea for this whole tutorial is that we have a 2D representation of some space. You could think of what we do also in the workshop later would be like a tabletop uh, um, situation where you have some objects on a table surface and you want to represent their spatial locations. And because we want to keep it as simple as possible and as controllable as possible, 
what we will do here actually is we will use one two-dimensional field, right? And uh, I'll show you this plot. And then add three objects to it by sort of simulating a scene by building it with three different Gaussian inputs. First, uh, I should probably explain what this new field plot here of the 2D field is about. Uh, before we had these three different lines, right, of, for activation in Potsum and the sigmoid activation, but these lines now turn into individual plots. So here's the plot of the input, here's the plot of the activation, sort of here's the plot of the sigmoid, so uh, activation above threshold. And what we have here now, otherwise, are these 2D Gaussian inputs. And uh, maybe let's put these all to the side here so you can see them. And uh, now these are all at the same location. And we want to have maybe a bit of more interesting visual scene here. So I will just move, move these around um, just in some way. Try to be random here. Or maybe go here a bit down and to the left or so. So these would be now our inputs that would represent sort of an object on a table surface, right? One in the top left corner, one in the right, and one in the bottom left corner. And what we could do is here, we could all move these to this new field to have them as separate inputs here. And then you can see um, this looks pretty much the same, but you have to really look on the color legend here. So the input here goes from zero to one, basically, while the activation from minus five to minus four, right, because of the resting level. And now we could actually do something with, with it here, but in order to have everything a bit more clean cut and to make it uh, so that we can manipulate the input at the same time, we would actually use some processing steps here that are pretty much the basic of CEDA. This is the sum and the static gain. So what this does, as you might imagine, it sums up multiple inputs, right? So we can just use these three inputs here and sum them up. If we plot this, this actually just puts them in the same representation, the same that we did with the neural field. And then what the static gain does is sort of a, a weight, right? This is, it's just a multiplication with a scalar value. The default here is one. So if I put this input here and I'll plot this, nothing happens, right? Multiplication with one. But if I now ramp this factor up, let's say to something like eight or so, then you see here, the input here has an amplitude of one and now the whole thing changed to from zero to eight, right? And this is, in that sense, is now helpful because now we have just one parameter to sort of tune all the three amplitudes at the same time. That's all it does, right? We could just keep this out and just right here, eight, eight and eight, but that's three clicks more, right? So we wanna be efficient. Uh, and this is an easy way to do something like that. So I increased the amplitude already to eight. So that should lead to three peaks in the field actually, right? Because the resting level is minus five. We add an input of eight. And even with some global inhibition that nets us some activation here at 2.7, for example, so above threshold. And this is then where you can see here three peaks. And uh, you might need to get used to that here. The peaks are always one color, right? Because the, the uh, sigmoid is very sharp. So, and the legend here goes from zero to one. So these are three blobs of activation here that are above threshold. And this would already be the first task, right? We have now three peaks from three inputs. So that's the multi-peak feed field. And to make this a bit obvious, we also name it that way, right? So then we know later what this field was about. So the other two things that I want to do now in this tutorial is I want to create a second field that realizes a working memory function and a third field that realizes selection. And in order to do this, I just copy the first one, right? The multi-peak field, and now change it into working memory and uh, connect this to our same input here, right? So given that it has the same parameters, you can see here it also has the same results, the same three peaks. But with a working memory, what we want to do is we want to, for example, remove one of the inputs here and then keep the information of that around. So as you can see here, now I removed one input and in both fields here, also the whole input is gone and the activation is also gone. But 
that's not what we want to have for the working memory. So we need to change its parameters here. In that sense, the kernel. As you might have uh, learned already in the lectures, the idea for working memory is always that you have no global inhibition and then a lot of self-excitation, right? And if we do this for this field now, let's first remove the global inhibition, remove this to zero, and then we can say, okay, let's just increase the amplitude of our kernel and everything should be fine. But of course, that's not the case. If we increase this more and more, you can easily see that the more activation comes up, it excites its neighbors, those excite their neighbors, and those excite their neighbors. You have sort of this cascading effect that all parts of the field are now excited, right? Everything is red here. So uh, the other thing, you still need some inhibition in your working memory field. And uh, I already talked about this previously. You, of course, need this Mexican head kernel, right? Where you allow something to excite itself, but also inhibits its surroundings. So you don't get this crazy merge here. Uh, so the idea is, as I showed before, we add a second kernel, here this Gaussian one, and then use negative amplitude and a bigger sigma. So rule of thumb is always just take twice the amount. So I just take six and then ramp this up maybe to, I don't know, let's see what happens. Maybe minus 10 should be fine. So now again, we have these three peak representations and we have like way more self-excitation and also some uh, inhibition here. If we plot this kernel again, um, you can go here with this full lateral kernel, depending on the colors on the screen, it's not as visible as in the 1D version, but you can see there's some bright spots here and then there's this dark circle around, right? Which resembles inhibition here. So that's the idea. Let's see if that works. So if we move one input, it actually didn't help, right? So there was not enough excitation to sustain this peak. So uh, we need to change our parameters. And that's sort of the typical workflow with CEDA also that allows you to quickly tune something. You have to have an idea about what the setup should be. Here we want a lot of self-excitation and some inhibition. And then you can adjust these parameters so that they fit your inputs. And the problem is there's no general solution for every type of input. Uh, so you have to do this by hand somewhat. But this is where CEDAR shines actually through this live interaction. So because I tried this before, of course, let's ramp up the excitation here a lot, like let's say 30, and then accordingly also increase the global, uh, the local inhibition here uh, to minus 28, for example. And now we get something that's also probably a good learning <laughs> advice. Yeah, I, I don't know if you, did you see the chat message? Uh... Question no. You can apply a differential gain, so different gain depending on the input. Yeah, we could also do that. Like you could change the, the value here for the input, or you could even uh, add like a different static gain, change the input here to something like three, and then use this for, for this field, right? But to keep everything simple, I wanted to just use the same input for all the three different fields to show that the difference really lies only in the tuning of the kernel of the fields. I hope that answered your question, or did you mean something entirely different? Okay, great. <laughs> um, so what we have here is now a little artifact because this activation here actually came about through our weird parameter tuning in between. And you might have used this in the other simulator already, what always helps to get the field back in its state it's supposed to be is using sort of this reset to the resting level, right? So where you just reset the activation to the resting level and then let it develop again normally. And uh, CEDA also has this button here. It's right next to the play button. It's the reset button. If you click this, all fields are sort of reset to resting level and then activation develops again. You can also reset individual fields by right clicking on them and then choosing reset, right? So that might help if you're in between tuning and then you have some artifacts lying around because you had some wrong values in between. Okay, back to the tuning here. We have now very high self excitation And if I remove this input here now, you can see that the activation actually stays around. It shrinks a bit, but mostly it stays around. While in our multi-peak field, everything is gone, right? There's no input, so no peak anymore. So this would already be sort of the working memory solution. And that works even if I remove sort of all the inputs here. We still have 
these three peaks here hanging around, right, being sustained. So that would be the second regime, the working memory. And the key to that, the thing that you need to take away, apart from the tuning, is you have no global inhibition, high self excitation, and then also uh, local inhibition to stop this merging from happening. And the last thing that I now want to sh show is selection. So selection is the case where we get three inputs, but only one of them moves above threshold. And uh, that has a different setting sort of for parameters. Here we want to have global inhibition, right? Because there's only one peak at a time. And we of course need some kind of excitation to counteract that global inhibition so that we can have a solution at all. And um, so I'll, I'll just copy it again by duplicating this field, uh, this other one. And I will now name this selection. And maybe one hint on this parameter tuning. I, of course, looked at the values before, but I would also want to say that for each of the different regimes, like selective working memory or just having multiple peaks, there's a broad range of parameters you can find, right? So it's not a very narrow parameter, parameter solution, but there's a huge range of parameters that work. So uh, that's why it's also an easy to find by just tuning by just scrolling through the values and so on. So as I said before, we want to remove all the uh, local inhibition here and now add global inhibition. So let's just say minus 0.3. Global inhibition, that's already quite a large value. The default value is 0, uh, 0.01, right? Uh, because global inhibition, the parameter is of a different scale because it applies everywhere instead of these local parameters. Um, we could have also changed that at some point in CEDAR, but somehow we stuck with these default values. Um, so now we have a lot of global inhibition. I should also plot this maybe. So right now there's no input. And if we add this input here, it somewhat works out, right? <laughs> Instead of three peaks, we have only two, but they also look uh, kind of small here. So uh, let's increase again uh, the whole thing. So maybe increase the local excitation a bit. And because we still have two things around, let's also increase uh, the global inhibition. So just make the amplify the whole effect, right? By getting more, choosing more extreme values for the inhibition as well as the excitation. And now you can see as a result, we only have one peak here that got chosen that was here on the, on the right side. And if we now reset this field, the, the choice is again random, right? So if I click reset here, uh, maybe move this to a different spot. If I click reset here, a different peak comes up, right? And whoever comes first, and here the, the noise is very important, will form a peak first, and this way it will inhibit all the others. So uh, then it's a classic winner takes all solution, right? So whenever I choose reset, I get sort of a random new peak location here. And even, for example, what could also happen if I remove this input, like the first one here, which is currently chosen, then a different thing will be selected, right? So if I remove this, it now selects the right one. So these were the three regimes that I wanted to show, like multi-peak, working memory, and selection. Working memory is actually a special case of multi-peak. And if you understood sort of the, the core idea behind these three things, then you are equipped to do the homework exercise. That's the whole idea. And uh, the homework exercise, maybe uh, are there any questions in between before I talk about the homework? I think they would have popped up in the chat by now. So I'll just continue, probably better for the recording. Um, but feel free to ask anytime. So what I showed you now was basically multi-peak detection. You can basically read through that uh, here as well. Uh, if you have no chance to listen to the video or want to do a, have it in text form, right, might be preferable. Uh, then you can all read up on that. And the last thing would be then this exercise. And here we want to build a very simple real architecture where a field is actually forwarding its activation to another field, right? Here in our example, I just used one input and then used that input and forwarded it to, to three fields. So what we really want to do now is build a whole architecture where one field forwards its activation. And the idea here would be to have a very simple uh, spatial 
representation architecture sort of. So the idea is here, and this part I already showed, basically you have some input and then build a scene representation field that represents these three objects on the table. That will already be the multi-peak solution. But the twist comes now here, the catch is so the spatial match field here, which is a selective field. And the idea is that we want to select only a subset of peaks, right? And only ones that match here our spatial description. And here in this very simple example, we only want to select an object that's in the left region sort of of the table, right? So the way you do it is by introducing sort of another bias input here, called the region input. So you can use, for example, a Gaussian here. And this way you can sort of tune the selective field to only select fields that are actually in the left side or in the right side, depending on what you want to do. So the trick is here again, as Gregor said earlier, to amplify these small differences, right? As I said before here, when everything is the same, it's only the noise that determines which uh, peak here gets selected. If you introduce some other input, it's way more, should be more than the noise, right? And then you can really steer where the selection should take place. And then as a, as a last thing to make you also reproduce the working memory part is also memorize the selected objects here in this field. And the idea that you can then do is you can sort of select different objects here and subsequently they will all be added to the working memory sort of in a sequential fashion. And that's very similar to all the visual scene representation architectures that we'll show in the case studies later. For example, uh, the talk of Raoul will have the very similar uh, attention mechanism sort of at, at the core of his hard architecture. And so that's something you'll see time and time again. So I really urge you to try this out, try this little exercise, uh, download CEDA. It's also very fun to play around with, right? And um, also all the workshop projects that are, uh, that everyone can participate in, right? They also all work with CEDA. So if you're interested in that, this exercise is really something you should do. I will explain sort of the uh, sample solution tomorrow before the lecture starts, similar to Daniel this morning, afternoon rather for us. Uh, so if you cannot get it done, uh, wait until then or post a question in the discussion forum. I will also check that. That would be the whole introduction to CEDA. Any questions that came up now in the last five minutes?